think we're live and I think we're recording. Sorry about that. I was waiting on Ustream to boot up on my machine, actually. Let's see. We'll go over to the page and see if anybody's there in the chat. It may or may not allow me to do that. I'm having problems with Ustream. I do have Twitter up, so if I lose you, I can check Twitter. I have a second monitor, thanks to my very best friend, Brenda. And chat is still swirling. So, right now you're just looking at a piece of fabric that I sized earlier. I'm going to get another frame. If somebody could tweet me or Facebook me and let me know if you can hear me, that would be great. I just got back from celebrating our friend Keith's birthday. It's his 50th birthday, so I'm running a little bit, be little bit behind. Actually, where's my smaller frame? I'll start with the smaller frame. Chat is still swirling over here, so I may or may not um, see you guys on see the chat. Start with a smaller frame. my frame for stretching my fabric. I'm going to uh, do a reset here and see if I can't get the chat to come up. Still waiting, still waiting. some pigments while I wait on chat. Let's see here, what do we have? Cast iron, that sounds good. So I'm getting some pigments, jars of pigments. I have some commercial pigments I've purchased. Chat is still swirling. I have some pigments that I've bottled up over the years. Uh, these pigments are from Earth Hues. They come in these lovely little test tube sets. Let's see if we can't get the chat to cooperate. We'll go out to Facebook and Twitter. Post this. Copy that. I'm also having problems with Twitter today. I'm only seeing half the page. I'm not seeing the There we go. Um, we don't want to do updates right now. Alrighty. Well, if you're watching as a guest, I cannot see it. I'm not sure which kind of chat I have up. I know there's several channels, and I haven't looked at uh, Carrie's instructions yet and on how to do chat on the other on the IRC. I need to do that. So if you can hear me or see me and don't see anything I'm writing, um, know that I'm recording this and that you can watch this at your own leisure later on. So that's some silk dupiani fabric here. I'm going to trim this down to fit my frame. I have a, I think that's a 12 inch square frame right there. And I 
my fabric is fairly crudely trimmed. And I'm just going to do a quick um, sizing with the soy milk on the Dupiani to show you how it's done. So I'll stretch my fabric for those of you who've never stretched fabric before. Now, as far as buying pigments and stuff, um, I purchased them online from various pigment houses like uh, Sinopia, uh, BioShield. Um, there's a new pigment company in New Mexico, or is it Arizona? I can't remember their name off the top of my head. I think it's called Earth Pigments, but I'm not sure. Um, I've had good luck with them in the past. I don't have the label in front of me right now. But there are, uh, um, there's Cremer out of New York. They import from Europe, etc. And uh, so I have a wide variety of places that I purchase pigments from here in the States. In addition to going out and collecting clays. I use the pigments also in encaustic and for making my own oil paints. So this is another reason why I have a large selection of pigments. It's not just for painting fabric and that's one of the reasons why I purchase pigments is for their purity. Um, but I do collect pigments, clays, iron oxides, ochres, etc. Um, I do. Uh, from local uh, creeks. Um, whenever there's a new construction site, sometimes there'll be some interesting looking clays and ochres and pigments that are uprooted, and I'll go ask for permission to dig. I do have chat, Dale. I have another monitor, thanks to my best friend Brenda. She brought me one. So I'm just stretching this fabric. It's just a little wooden frame that my husband built for me out of one by twos. And he reinforced the corners. And I already have some fabrics that are um, sized, but I thought you guys would like to see how the fabric looks being sized. Grab my brush. You want to use natural bristle brushes. Um, I use these cheap, inexpensive uh, hog, brush, hog bristle brushes known as chip brushes. Uh, to size my fabric with because the soy milk is kind of hard on the um, on the bristles and so are the pigments. So I have a, I have a set of paint brushes that I use almost exclusively for painting fabric with with iron oxides. Let me give this a swirly. I'm, I'm pouring out this is uh, my soy milk that I made yesterday and I'm pouring some into a cup. A paper cup is all I'm using. Yes, Dale, anytime you're working with clays and stuff like that, um, use the less expensive brushes. Or if you're going to use the expensive brushes, I know there are several artists that use the expensive Japanese brushes. Um, they have brushes though exclusively for um, painting with the earth oxides and stuff like that. They don't use them for dyes. They have brushes specifically for working with dyes. So I'm just, this is Silk Dupiani. Um, I buy it by the roll from a Fabric Wholesaler. And I'm just painting the silk with the soy milk. You could paint it stretched, or you could put it in a bucket and swish it around in a bucket of soy milk. I find that I um, achieve better coverage if I paint it stretched. I'm less likely to have streaks and missed spots. And especially with a fabric like Dupiani, which tends to be a little ornery, here you can see a white mark, a white line here, where the the silk is denser. I'm not sure if, how well this is showing up on the 
camera I'll raise it in a second um, that area will require more soy milk and you may not necessarily see that if you have your soy in a bucket if I'm doing really large pieces or heavy t-shirts or something like that um, cotton, heavy cotton t-shirts I will put it in the bucket um, actually I don't put it in the bucket so much as this. I put it in my washing machine and I put it on agitate and then let it soak and then agitate it some more so that is an option but you know obviously you're going to need to make um, three or four gallons of soy milk in order to use the washing machine um, in the video that I posted yesterday to YouTube on making soy milk for sizing fabric I do believe that's the label it has um, I used two cups of soybeans, organic soybeans, to achieve one gallon of soy milk. So that would tell you, proportionately speaking, how much beans you would need to achieve four gallons. And if you're doing a bunch of t-shirts and large amounts of yardage, I would definitely do the make three or four gallons of soy milk and then put it in the washer. So, good. I'm glad to see that the So you can see kind of the, the, the grain, for lack of a better word, the, the weave, um, the warp and the, the weft, the way the Dupiani um, is textured. And so some areas are heavier and they just require more soy milk. Now I'm going to let this dry. Um, it's currently not very humid down here, so it'll take three hours for this to dry approximately. Um, and I'm going to bring up one of my finished panels that's already dried from earlier. So, the question probably is, is why even paint with earth pigments? This is a piece of silk charmeuse I did about approximately three hours ago. And I'm going through and I'm reusing some of my silk fabrics that I had dyed and more than it previously. This poor thing needs to be iron. It's cotton. You can do the pigment painting on leather you can do it on cotton, you can do it on linen, hemp, silk, wool. If your wool has a nice, uh, oh, what I want to call it, uh, doesn't have a heavy weave, uh, but it has a fine weave, so it has a smoother surface. So this this piece here I did probably 2003, 2004, maybe even earlier. And the middle area is blue, if it's not showing up. Yes, the pigment paints need soy milk. So, I'll, and I'll explain that in a second. Thank you for asking, Dale. You'll keep me keep me going. Um, so this is blue. It was done with Maya Blue, which is a type of indigo pigment. And the fabric is cotton. It's been sized, and the the soy sizing will change the hand of the fabric. This fabric is a little stiffer. It was a piece of seventy eight seventy eight. It's just a, that's the correlation number for the type of muslin it is. Um, this is a, a, a French ochre, and then the maroon was from, oh, I forget what that is. English red, I do believe it was. No, it was magnanese brown. So, the reason why you, saw it, you um, put uh, soy milk on the fabric. You could use soy milk, you could use... Um, acorn milk, anything that's uh, uh, kind of like a, a nut or a seed like that. I know some people use rice milk. I use soy milk because the squirrels always beat me to the acorns. The soy acts kind of as a starch so it makes your fabric stiff as you can see. This was a lot looser before I uh, um, painted it. Makes it taut but pigments by their very nature sit on top of the fibers. They do not bond with the fiber molecules. Dyes, plant dyes, bond with the fiber molecules. So in order to make ensure that the pigments are permanent onto the fabric, we use a binder. In this case, the binder is soy milk. Soy has protein molecules in it that when it's wetted and then the um, pigments are applied. I've mixed my Maya Blue pigment with soy milk. It actually creates a molecular bond 
so that the um, pigment is not so easily knocked off the fiber's surface. And I hope I explained that correctly. I, well, I explained it correctly, but as to whether or not it's simple enough to understand. Um, I have a background in chemistry, so sometimes I can get really carried away with the uh, um, nutty professor uh, science guy type explanations and really get into it. In fact, we were just discussing that over lunch, and the person who was sitting across the table from me, luckily, thankfully, has a background in chemistry and understood exactly everything that I was babbling about a hundred miles a minute. Do I sell the pigments? No, I do not sell the pigments anymore, Dale Ann. I used to, and um, I didn't, my supplier passed away, and I didn't want to get into the business of importing and exporting, so I do not sell the pigments. You can buy them from Krenmer. It's a pigment house in New York. They import from Europe. You can uh, purchase from Sinopia. Earth Hue sells them. Um, trying to think, there's a place in, I repeated it earlier, uh, um, in, uh, I think it's outside of uh, Scottsdale, Arizona. There's a pigment house there. I think it's called Earth Pigments or something like that. Or Nature's Pigments or Nature's Earth or Earth's Nature. Or if you Google pigments, it'll come up. And she sells to a lot of people who are doing like milk painting and are doing the adobe houses. So this is one of the Earth Hues pigments right here. The color is called Maize Clay. And I'm just going to sprinkle a little bit of this. Make sure you wear a uh, dust mask. I'm just going to sprinkle a little bit of this into my soy milk. And then just mix it with my spoon. And some of these you have to mix 24 hours in advance. The Maya Blue I, I mixed a couple of hours ago because uh, some of them are not readily soluble so they need to sit longer or they need to be heated up. And I'm going to grab a paintbrush. And so the painting process on this is actually quite simple and it's once the prepper, prep um, is completed then all you have to do is paint your fabric and you can paint your fabric up to two weeks in advance but then the soy starts to harden off and the ability to work with it uh, becomes greatly decreased so this is my Maya Blue and if you have questions Dale go ahead and ask and the more pigment you put in here the darker it gets but there is a saturation point um, where you have too much pigment per the amount of soy milk bubbles on the fabric are okay but if you can brush as many of them out as possible that's even better and unless you use a gouda resist or a wax resist your pigments will uh, bleed outward just like you would if you were using normal fabric paint or fabric dye. The Maya Blue I purchased from Krenmer Pigments. It's uh, K-R-E-M-E-R. -E They're out of New York. And I, I love the Maya Blue, or Mayan Blue, however you want to pronounce it. And as I'm painting this, it's just like painting with fabric paint. You can kind of, each time I put my brush in, I swirl my brush before I take a take pigments out, and I'm watching the fabric, and I can see where the pigment load is the heaviest or the lightest. And um, right here, it's very very light and I don't even think you can see it on the camera and here it's very dark so I have more pigment in the middle and while it's still wet I can just kind of take my brush and kind of gently coax it out into the outer areas and kind of level out the pigment Dale when do you leave for uh, um, Spain?
Then I have some uh, concrete colors here that I purchased at my hardware, big box hardware store. And I'm just going to mix, ooh, Monday. I'm going to mix a little bit of this uh, red concrete color in with my soy milk. And I don't need very much soy milk at all to use with my concrete color because the concrete color is liquidy. If your concrete color comes to you in a powder form, then you'll have to use quite a bit of soy milk. Oops, hang on a second. I need to go wake up the other computer. Come on, sleepyhead. And the concrete colors are just iron oxides. And this is like a deep terracotta red, really deep terracotta red. I have a terracotta color also, and it's slightly more orange than this red. But I'd say they're both overall terracotta colors. And if you, like again, if you don't want the colors to bleed into one another, then you'll have to lay down a Gouda Resist. And then I have another concrete color here called Buff. I had a had a, somebody from the Dyer's List emailed me and asked me how to use the concrete colors with the... That's got too much in it. With the soy milk. So this is part of the reason I'm doing this video. So I'm just taking my concrete color. I have a very small amount of soy milk in the bottom of my glass. And I'm just taking my concrete color. And I'm probably putting maybe a tablespoon in there. I'm going to take my brush and swirl it around. And I get this lovely kind of a yellow-orange color. They say this is buff, but I think it's more of an ochre color actually. And the instructions for doing all of this is in my Rust and Clay Dyeing book, which is available at my website. And of course I will be leaving the recording up. But there's way more information in the Rust and Clay Dying book on curing times and stuff. Um, the longer you can let this sit, the better. Um, myself, I personally recommend six months to a year, but at a minimum, you should let it sit six weeks. Wash your brushes out very well when you're done. Otherwise, you will be stuck with pigment permanently attached to your paint brushes. I'm going to move this down a little bit so you can see what I'm working on. Yeah, definitely no hurrying here, Dale. Um, let me mix up some uh, cast iron. I'm going to pour some more soy milk here. Cast iron is, well, exactly what it sounds like. It's a black pigment, black iron oxide. Most of the things I do require anywhere from a... In fact, I have one particular person who's still waiting for her fabric. She would have got it sooner, except the, the first piece got eaten by the compost pile. Um, clean up my mess here. Um... Most of my fabrics I work on for a period of anywhere from a year to two years. Okay, I need one more paper cup for the... Oh. 
hopefully you can hear me. I guess apparently the broadcast stopped temporarily. I don't know if it rotted totally, Dale, or if, uh, if a critter got into the compost pile and absconded with it. I'm really not sure what happened. Um, sometimes when you have, uh, it's, we've had a couple of flood year, years in a row here. And that can be problematic. You can also mix uh, natural dye extracts in with the soy milk for painting. Right now I'm making, this is called cast iron. There we go. So it's a dark charcoal. Um, I don't know if Table Rock Llamas in Colorado still sells pigments or not, but at one time they did. Alright, so we have a little black here. This brush is stiff. This is one of those things that you can just take your it's best to be in a frame of mind of being slow and methodical. Um, you really can't rush it. It's sort of like working with oil pastels or watercolors. Where you almost need my music. Okay, move you this way so you can see what I'm doing. I'm just doing more dots, I'm kind of in a polka dot mood. I have uh, two other pieces over here that are drying. I have a silk dupiani piece that's almost ready and I can show you how it looks with the pigments on it. And again I'm just swirling my brush to make that pigment float so that I'm picking it up with my bristles. If I don't swirl my brush then it looks more like a wash And the black spots look black in the video, but they're actually kind of a dark charcoal. I did buy a black, um, it's called charcoal, a uh, concrete color, but it actually shows up as black. So some of these things can actually be purchased from a local clay house or a local um, big box store, uh, home repair store. So this is the four concrete colors I bought from a big box store. This is red, buff, red, buff, charcoal, and terracotta. And on the, in the video there doesn't look to be much of a difference between the red and the terracotta, but the terracotta is actually more brown and slightly more orangish. So we'll do a little bit more with this and then we'll bring the Dupiani over here. Use some of the corn yellow here. Make them look like little atoms. Not sure if the yellow is showing up or not. 
There we go. But you can see it now. Trying to get the bubble out. Almost fell through your finger. When working with the pigments and mixing them, really you should wear a respirator and use dry box techniques because the, some of the pigments are actually quite hazardous to your health if inhaled. So keep that in mind when working with the pigments. Because I have electronics on my table, I'm trying very carefully here not to spill anything. Which is easier said than done when you have a gallon of soy milk sitting on your table next to you. And again, you can apply. That's the corn yellow down that's really subtle, thank you. And you can apply several layers of the soy and pigment. but it doesn't need to be on my fabric. Put some blue down here. Hi Rose. I think it is Rose, right? Okay, rose it is. I figured a lot of people probably weren't going to catch this with the holiday weekend and everything, but, and so I'm recording it. probably won't be here very long today. An hour maybe. So I'm going to set this one aside. I'm going to put it on a flat surface so it will dry. And not drip. This is a piece of Silk Dupiani. See you later Rose. And um, this pieces, these these two pieces I was working on are um, whatever fat quarter size is. Just completely and totally drew a blank. Uh, Dupiani has more texture, so you might find that you need to scratch or scrub your pigments a little more deeply into the fabric. In case you're wondering, I have a skull hanging on the wall over here, although I think I got the horns completely wrong, but you know that's what it makes, makes it mine, right? Um,
So this is the red. Thank you. <laughs> My uh, drawing skills, I think, have gotten a little lax recently, so thank you, Dale. It's been raining nonstop. I want to just go outside and paint. There we go. That fixes it. The antlers are not quite right, or horns I should say, but that's okay. Let's see what do we have here. Yeah, we're getting a lot of rain here as well. I'm going to take this subtle yellow, the corn yellow, and I'm going to paint on the whole thing that's open. Really need a different brush. This is not the correct brush for this. One moment. Let's see, what do we have up here? Again, I'm working with all natural bristle brushes. Do, 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 do. Nope, wrong size. This will work. Um, for these, I buy the natural bristle brushes in the value packs at the big box craft stores when they're on sale. Um, they usually go on sale a couple of times a year. And I just buy the variety packs. And these brushes are bought known that they will pretty much not survive the year. So are you excited about going to uh, Spain yet? For those who are wondering, I'm talking to Dale Ann Potter in chat and she is going to Spain to take a workshop with some world-renowned teachers and it is definitely an opportunity of a lifetime. So you won't see that part in the chat. It's starting to get you excited. Cool. Is your husband getting excited about you going? Yes, he can eat all the pork he wants when you're gone. Yeah, I'm surprised you don't eat pork. My mom preferred it over beef. She said it tasted most like seal. Little bacon. Yeah, I finally found a bacon that I actually like eating that doesn't make me horribly ill. <clears throat> so I'll let the center part dry and I'll make up some designs. The nice thing about this is doing this with the pigments, if the longer you let this sit and cure once you do wash it, 
you can apply all sorts of natural dye techniques over the top of it. I have several pieces that I went on and compost dyed. Um, after I pigment dyed them. They're my stash upstairs. I didn't bring them down. Um, and they're really lovely. It's a little harder to get crisp, de crisp designs on the Dupiani. Yes, the soy does wash off, wash out pretty well. It does change the hand of the fabric. Uh, some fabrics more so than others. Like the one cotton I have, it, the hand was definitely... Um, fabric became very stiff even with repeated washings but the upside is is the pigment is still as vivid as it was the day I painted it now when this dries just like painting with dyes or paints or watercolors or what have you um, you will the intensity will lessen as much as by 30 percent yes I wash it out before I dye it but like a mordant, because the, the soy has permanently bonded with the uh, fabric, um, the soy will always be a part of the structure, molecular structure of the fabric from here on out. And this is why a lot of the Japanese um, and Chinese textiles have survived for thousands of years, basically intact, is because they were sized or starched, for lack of a better word, with soy milk. Um, and that was always the basis. Their first, their first step was always the soy process. Um, some places also used a couple of types of gums and a rice gum, um, and basically it acts like almost like armor all for for fabric. And basically, so this this is pretty much that's all there is to this. Is I'm trying to. To painting with the uh, earth pigments and as I said you can go ahead and use the concrete dyes um, some artists have uh, ground up pastels um, I don't if you're going to grind up pastels you definitely want to have a ventilation system and a respirator wearing a respirator and uh, dust collection and all that other stuff so that you don't make yourself sick um, but uh, I do have uh, some unison pastels that I've used. I'm trying to get this moved over so you can see the other side. And I've drawn directly onto the wet soy fabric. I sized the fabric with soy, let it dry for a couple of days, and then um, usually a day or two, and then come back and re-wet my soy fabric and apply the pastels to it. Just like I would be drawing on watercolor paper or pastel paper or whatever substrate I'm, you know, you would normally work on, and um, let it dry, and then uh, let it cure, and it will behave just like if you had used the pigments. And again, my favorite pastels to work with are unison because there's no latex in the binder. Um, you could do this with watercolors, uh, using dry brush techniques with watercolors on sized, soy sized fabric, and um, that's how the Japanese did a lot of their uh, kimono paintings. They would create lakes with the natural dyes, um, which is how watercolors were originally um, derived from uh, plant dyes, is to create what's known as a lake, and it's um, it's a it's not a distillation; it's an extraction and distillation process. Um, but you can buy watercolors, and I would recommend using the expensive watercolors, not the cheap watercolors, because um, the binders that are into watercolors do make a difference. So that's pretty much it. Did you have any questions, Dale? Actually, doesn't look half bad on the screen, does it? I'll I'll work on this some more later and uh, finish it. 
I answered the ones that you have? Okay. So the most important thing is, you know, when you make your soy milk, um, and the other computer just went into hibernation again, so I hope it's still recording. Um, you make your soy milk, you can keep it up towards of two weeks in the refrigerator, um, paint your fabric with the soy milk, size it. You really should use your fabric within two weeks. Uh, sooner is better. Um, I have some pieces where I did wait four to six weeks um, after painting the fabric with the soy milk. Uh, the problem I ran into was not being able to remove the, si uh, the sizing. did something strange. Like I said, this one came out stiff. This is the only finished piece I have down here. Unfortunately, I, the rest of my fabrics are upstairs. I'll take pictures of them and I'll put them on my blog, which is the natural surface blogspot.com. And I could put that in the notes on the video. So I'll find my fabrics and I will uh, uh, press them. I have these here that I did. This was done with Gouda. I don't know if you can see this one. It's so dark. Here we go. This one was done with Gouda and So it did kick me off. So yes, I just fixed the recording. Can you hear me now, Dale? This one was done with size, uh, soy, soy sized hepatite silk hanky and watercolors and I used a Gouda Resist. So I'll have to put in the notes on this video that the video stopped a couple of times. Um, this was just a... This might have been soy sized with natural dyes. This one was natural dyes, soy sized, and alcohol inks. The soy will, the soy binder will keep the alcohol inks from washing out. This is soy sized alcohol inks and shiva paint sticks. Same thing, soy sized alcohol inks and shiva paint sticks using stencils. And here you can see the stencil lines more better here. So, I have a lot more that I've done on cotton that have been based on the cattle skulls. I just, I need to, to locate them, press them, and I'll photograph them and put them on the website. Several of those are actually showcased in the book. So, anyway, thank you very much for coming, Dale. And um, for everybody else that's watching this, I will be hopefully streaming again soon now that I have a second monitor and computer to do this with. Um, and there's a, I'm teaching online classes over at the Natural Surface uh, .ning network and there's more information over there if you want to join um, on tutorials and stuff and I'll be adding more in the next week etc as I've been working on developing the, the network. Thank you for coming down and asking me questions because you reminded me of things I probably would have forgotten to mention. So, and have a great trip over in Spain. I can't wait to see what you do when you come back. Anyway, so I'm going to go because I have a dog that misses me terribly and I will find my other fabrics. So, thank you everybody for watching.